All right, hey, welcome back to church. It's a whole lot warmer in here. So we're in the book of Acts, chapter 10. A uh, series is called Scattered to Grow. Church was scattered by persecution, but they grew deeper in their faith. They grew much broader in their impact around the world. And today in Acts 10, we come to two guys, Cornelius, a foreigner, a Roman soldier, and Peter, a follower of Jesus Christ, an apostle. You know, God has a way of orchestrating divine appointments where people who need to know Jesus and people who already follow Jesus are brought together by the power of God. And today we want to look at what it would take for us to be ready for those kind of moments. I tell you what, most followers of Jesus would love the opportunity to share their faith with those who don't know him yet. It's a privilege and a joy. But before God gives you that opportunity, you're going to need to see those people the way that God does. And that's what Acts 10 is all about here. So I'm going to start reading at verse 1 and invite you to read along. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, and was, uh, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor, prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives by the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened, and he sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, birds. And then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter declared. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. And then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. <clears throat> Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, Peter was puzzling over his vision. The Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up. Go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. <coughs> so Peter went down. He said, I'm the man you were looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them and accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet <coughs> and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. So they walked together and went inside <coughs> where many others were assembled. Peter told them, You know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now, tell me why you sent for me. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, today we are just delighted that in Jesus Christ you are building a kingdom, you are building your family here and around the world. 
Lord, we thank you that by your grace, you invite us to come to you, to know you, to be rescued and changed by you. And Lord, that your desire is to fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can be used by you to reach our community. Lord, we pray for our nation these days. Uh, it's been a difficult, challenging year in so many ways. We need your help. We need your grace. We need your mercy. We pray that, our, that your will will be done and all things pertain to this election. And Lord, no matter what the outcome of it is, we pray that we may live every day and pray every night as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. So Lord, use this word and use it to shed light on our path as we want to know and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, <clears throat> so what's today about? Today is about being ready for divine appointments that God can orchestrate in your life to bring somebody who needs to know Jesus along somebody who already follows Jesus. That's our whole reason for being here as a church. We want to bring glory to God by following Jesus together. That leads to a mission. We're here to invite all people to follow Jesus, then engage all people to grow in their faith, and then to equip everybody to serve Jesus. But if we're going to be actually useful in that mission, we have got to see people the way God does. The reality is you will not be in position to share your faith in Christ with people who need him unless you first see them the way that God does. And you know as well as I do that our world today is as divided by uh, anger and race and ethnicity and politics and violence and history and all kinds of things as deeply divided as the world that Peter and Cornelius lived in. So today I want to take a look at three things. First, Cornelius, he was a God seeker. Uh, secondly, we want to look at the sender, that is God himself. God sends people. And third, Peter, the man sent. As God sent Peter with good news, God can send us if we're ready to hear and obey and do God's will. So we start with Cornelius. Um, he was not Jewish. He was Roman. He was an Italian soldier. He was a foreigner. He lived in the wrong city, Caesarea, named after Caesar, was the Roman provincial capital by which the Roman Empire kept their thumb <clears throat> on the whole region. Not only did uh, Cornelius <coughs> live there, but he was a Roman officer. He was paid to enforce Roman law with a sword. He commanded men. He was there <coughs> to keep um, the force of the empire intact, whatever Caesar's orders might be. Um, frankly, most Jewish people would be just fine happy if all Roman soldiers were dead and gone. But that was not the whole story about Cornelius. He was a God-fearing man. Now, we don't know what his background is. Maybe his family background had been uh, pagan idol worshipers, uh, Jupiter, the king of the gods, Venus, the goddess of passion and fertility, Mercury, the god of uh, money and finance, uh, Mars, the god of war. Maybe that's what they worshipped. The ancient gods were like uh, a game of thrones in the skies. But maybe that wasn't Cornelius' background. A lot of educated Romans had already turned away from that. And they were much more interested in philosophy and logic and reason and uh, uh, points of view like Stoicism, which uh, focused on reason and ethics. Well, whatever it was, it was not enough for Cornelius. He knew there had to be more. And when he crossed path with Judaism and the God of the Bible, he found something he was looking for. One creator God who ruled sovereign over the universe. One God who is holy and just and merciful and kind and faithful. And then out of the character of that one God, an ethical way to live that was a reflection of God's character. So we are called to be just and truthful and fidelity and generosity and mercy and forgiving because those ethics are grounded in the nature of the creator God, the God of the Old Testament. So although he was not Jewish, uh, he was a God-fearing man who prayed daily to God, who sought to live a life of uh, generosity and mercy towards those in need. <coughs> he was widely respected by a Jewish community that he did not belong to. He was widely respected by Jewish people who would never invite him into their home and who in turn would never go into his home because of the Jewish law. 
Well, all that changed dramatically one day when God decided to do some sending and he shook up Cornelius' world during his prayer time with this angel who comes with a command, send men to Joppa, find Peter, he's got something to say. <coughs> Cornelius, being a good soldier, knew how to listen to orders and he knew how to give them and immediately he responded to the direction of the Lord. So I want you to understand that um, God sends people uh, God stirs up people's heart. God reaches out to people, sometimes in unique and extraordinary ways. He had clearly already been at work in the life of Cornelius and his family. He had clearly already been at work in the city of Caesarea before Peter ever gets there. God is at work. We said it last week in last week's message. God does stuff. And one of the things that God does is he stirs in people's heart. He creates a hunger. He creates a thirst for himself. He creates a longing. And that moves people to seek God. And the Bible says that if we seek God, we will find him. In fact, not only does it say that, it says that God is seeking us like a shepherd coming after lost sheep. So if you want to be a good news person... Um, Take a load off your shoulders. This is not all on you. This is not all on the church's shoulders. God is already at work in the lives of people around us. And the issue for us is to be ready for the people that God sends our way and then to be ready for the people that God will send us to. Because God is going to orchestrate divine appointments where people who need to know Jesus and people who follow Jesus are going to get to come into a meaningful relationship. Well, Cornelius was already prepared, but Peter had yet to be prepared. Peter had to be prepared to be a man sent. He's already a follower of Jesus. He's already been a bold preacher. He's already been willing to face persecution. He's already seen friends of his martyred. He's already left his homeland to follow his calling. He's already seen mighty movements of God, and yet... Peter does not yet see people the way God does. He does not yet see a Gentile world that God wants to reach with the good news of Jesus Christ. So he's hungry, he's on the roof, he's having prayer time, and God rocks his world in order to make him a man who's ready to be sent. So what is this vision about? He's praying, he sees a sheet coming down. Uh, the sheet is covered with <clears throat> all kinds of animals. Um, now, in the Jewish law, animals uh, could be divided into two categories. Clean, pure animals were available for food and for sacrifice. Vast majority of animals in the world were considered unclean, impure. You would not sacrifice them to God, and you would not eat them. <coughs> now, in our American mindset, we tend to think about diet and health, and that's really not the concern of the Old Testament. The concern of the Old Testament is that God was creating a people devoted to Him, and in order to be at work in their lives, he needed to keep them separated from the pagan Gentile nations around them. And so food laws, along with much of the other laws and restrictions of the Old Testament, were in place to keep the Jews, God's people, apart from non-Jews. Uh, if you think about it, you're never going to get into a relationship. You're never going to have a friendship. You're never going to become family with people who you can't sit down and share a table with. Um, uh, we've often said around here, uh, Pastor John says it all the time, food helps build fellowship. Food is a vehicle for creating relationships. Well, that was true in Old Testament law, but the law was designed to keep Jews together, but keep them apart from the rest of the world. <coughs> so God says to uh, Peter, Peter, get up, kill and eat. And the problem is there's all kinds of animals that he can't kill and eat there. Not according to the law, not according to every teaching, tradition, Bible story he's ever heard in his whole life. Because, yeah, you got goats, but you also got horses. You got sheep, but you got camels. You got uh, cattle, but you got snakes and toads and dogs and cats and probably lots of pigs. And in all this, God is saying, get up, kill, and eat. Well, not only are the animals unclean in and of themselves, but Jewish law laid out the way butchering needed to happen so that the food was clean, that it was kosher. <clears throat> Peter's not at all in position to do that. In fact, Peter's living in the home of a tanner who touches dead animal bodies all the time. Peter's already living in an unclean household, and now he's being told to eat unclean food, and he just absolutely revolts and says, God, I've never done that. 
And here's where it gets serious. God says, do not call unclean what God has made clean. <clears throat> that Old Testament law was there for a reason. It had a purpose in time in the unfolding of God's story. That chapter has closed. A new chapter is about to begin. And if we go all the way back to the beginning of God's work in, in the nation of Israel, it was a man named Abram given a great promise that God would give many descendants, but also a promise that the nation that would come from him would ultimately be a blessing to all families on earth. Well, for that blessing to move forward with the good news of Jesus Christ, these food laws would have to come down. That fence, that barrier would have to be dismantled so that a guy like Peter could walk into the house of a guy like Cornelius. They could sit down and share a meal and they could talk about the most important thing of all the world. And that is having peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God that God provided to take away the sins of the world. Jesus is the one who has come first to bring reconciliation vertically between humanity and God, but then horizontally between people who've been divided and at odds at each other for generations, sometimes for centuries. So this vision was so important. Peter didn't get the vision one time. He had to have it three times in order for God to make his point before three guys showed up knocking on the door. And when they did, it all comes clear that the vision is not just about animals on the sheet. The vision is not just about the food on your plate. The issue is, Peter, how do you see people? Do you see people outside of your system, outside of your background, outside of your Old Testament law? Do you see them as impure, unclean, unfit for you to enter their home? And God says, no more. So Peter goes with them the next day. <clears throat> he enters their home. This is what he says. You know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. Now take a pause right there. I want you to understand this isn't just about Cornelius. The reason this whole story is so important is this is about the rest of the world outside Judaism. This is about 99% of the human race. This is about you and I. This is about our families, our homes. This is about Minnesota and everywhere else on the planet. Peter says, it's against the law for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone <coughs> as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. <clears throat> Folks, <clears throat> um, Cornelius sent for Peter, and Peter was ready to be sent because God sends people, because God is at work in all this. And God had to do first a work in Cornelius, but he had to do just as big a work in Peter to bring these two together so that the best news in the world could go from a Jewish launch pad to a Gentile world with the message of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so where is our application for us today? Uh, you probably don't have a kosher household and you probably don't visit many homes that do. Uh, maybe there's some application for you in terms of food. Uh, maybe you've got people in your life who are vegetarian or vegan or organic. And uh, my question for you is in the cause of Christ, are you going to let any food issues come between you and being a good news person to people who maybe look at their plate in their refrigerator in the restaurant differently than you do. Don't let food get in the way of carrying the best news, that is the love of God and Jesus Christ. Uh, for other people, the divisions, the boundaries, the homes that you would not go into, the people you would never invite in, probably has nothing to do with food. Uh, maybe for some it might have to do with economics, rich, middle class, poor. Uh, too much education, not enough education, what their career is, what their vocation is, what their lifestyle is like. Um, it could be language, it could be ethnicity, it could be a hundred things. People are great at creating divisions. God is great at breaking down barriers. So for me, here's the biggest one today. You all know this is election week in the U.S. of A. 
And uh, I think we all have a pretty good idea of what this year has felt like. We have not felt like the United States in a long time. We have definitely felt more like the divided states of America. Uh, for my own self, personally, I think today in our secular society, where so many people are influenced by so much that is worldly and is not of God, politics have become like a pseudo-religion. It's the main source of your identity. It's your hope for the future. It's your place of prosperity, security. It's what you're willing to fight and if necessary, even to die for. Folks, if you are a follower of Jesus, we believe in a kingdom that is going to endure forever. Nations and empires like Israel, like the Roman Empire, like the USA, these are the things that are temporary. It is the kingdom of God that will endure forever. Candidates, elections, policies, these things are important, but these things come and go. These things are temporary. It is human beings. It is a human soul that is going to spend eternity either with God or apart from God. Jesus did not die for nations. Jesus did not die for laws. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for guys like Cornelius, a Roman, and everybody in his family. Jesus died for a guy like Peter, a sinner, and all of his friends and family. And Jesus died not only so that they could be reconciled to God as children of God and citizens of an eternal kingdom, but that they could ultimately be reconciled together into one new people who would bring glory to God by living for Jesus Christ. Folks, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, let me just ask you, how do you see Republicans? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, how do you see Democrats? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what do you see when you see somebody who doesn't care about politics and never votes? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what are you going to do if somebody from the alt-right moves in on one side of the street and somebody from Antifa moves on, on the other side of the street and you're right there in the middle professing the name of Jesus Christ? What do you see in people? What do you see when God brings people across your path who see things differently than you do, look different than you, think different than you do, speak different than you do, vote different than you do? What are you going to see? Because I'll tell you this, folks, if what we see is impure, unclean, can't talk to them, nothing in common, would never have them in my home, would never reach out, folks, then we will be useless for building the kingdom of God. But if our eyes are opened up like Peter's has been, then we'll see that there is no person in the world that is not created in the image of God. There's no person on this planet that is not loved by God. There is no sinner whose path you will ever cross who Christ has not died for them to be their savior. And there is no person on this planet who could not have a radical encounter with a risen Jesus Christ and a new birth by the Holy Spirit and even this day become a member of God's family forever. Folks, what do you see? Has God shaken up your vision yet? If not, I hope he does it soon because what I'm praying for for this church is divine appointments. That we will be the people who know that we have been sent with the best news in the world and we are eagerly waiting, praying, asking for God to send us divine appointments that will invite new people to trust and follow Jesus Christ forever. Folks, that's my prayer, and I hope you'll pray with me, particularly as we pray for our election, as we pray for this season in our nation that's been so full of challenges. Will you join me in praying for this church and the churches of this region for divine appointments where people come into a new relationship with Jesus Christ and that the followers of Jesus Christ are ready to cross any fence and break down any barrier that would inhibit the forward movement of the kingdom of God. Well, <clears throat> we're going to leave you here with something. A little invite to dinner. Uh, my wife and I, care. we're talking about food. And she said something very strange to me this week. She said, you know, since I married you, I've ended up eating all kinds of things that I never would have imagined eating. I was like, really? Because I, I couldn't think of what. I mean, I bring home some wild game, you know, eat some venison and some waterfowl, some fish. But I'm like... 
what do we eat that's strange? I couldn't really think of anything, you know? I mean, yeah, I went out hunting this, this fall and I didn't see a lot and I, I didn't get a lot, but you know, there were a lot of crows around, like lots of crows, more crows than you ever would have imagined. I thought, you know, this is too much bounty. You really shouldn't look away from what God is offering you. So I thought, man, I'm gonna stack up a pile of crows because, you know, they'll eat. I mean, they're not pheasant, but you gotta take what you, what's at hand. And you know, with the crows come some vultures and you get a vulture. You know, you get a pretty decent sized piece of meat there. So, hey, it all goes in the pot, some potatoes, some carrots, some celery, some onions, a little hot sauce. It's going to be okay. So I'm driving home one day, and uh, here's a coyote right on the side of the road. And the coyote, boy, he is lunching down on some roadkill porcupine. And, I mean, this wasn't like a little skinny new, you know, new baby porcupine. Th this guy had been around a long time. And he's pretty much already tenderized because it looked like it had been a pretty big Mack truck that hit him. So I pulled over. I said, hey, coyote, get out of here. That's mine. It's coming home. And you know what? Pretty tender stuff, low fat, high protein. Uh, porcupine is highly underrated. So we just put it in with a crow and vulture and a little salt and a little pepper. And then, you know, I thought it's still missing something. And it dawned on me. This summer out where we live, you would not believe the crop of toads we had. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Karen and I went out for a walk one night and across the road, it was like a plague of toads. I mean, they were everywhere. You could hardly walk without getting toad on the bottom of your shoe. Well, Carol went to bed that night and I wanted to stay up a little while and I thought, you know, that is a pretty generous provision. There's no need for all that to go to waste. So I went out and I scooped up 12 or 15 pounds of toad, put it in the freezer. Don't tell my wife, because uh, what you do is you just kind of blend in a little bit of it in with the other things, and it's kind of like a filler. It doesn't have a lot of taste, but it's surprisingly low fat. So anyway, <clears throat> it's all in the pot. It's all ready for dinner, and my question to you is, are you ready to come over and eat tonight? <coughs> oh, because it's cooking up good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. And uh, some of you might be rolling your eyes. You might be curling your nose. You might be saying, oh, that's disgusting, or oh, I would never. And I would just say, don't curl up your nose and don't write off if the Lord says it's what's on the menu. It's clean. It's good. It's going to be great. <coughs> Folks, remember, Acts 10 is not about critters. It's not about the food on your plate. It's about what you see in your neighbors, your family, your co-workers, your fellow citizens, people here close at hand and people on the other end of the world. What do you see when you see people? Folks, if you see people the way Jesus does, then you're ready to be a good news person. And if you don't see people the way Jesus does, if you're still going around life saying impure, unclean, nothing in common, couldn't possibly talk to them. They're the bad guys. We're the good guys. Hey, if that's you, then just like get ready. Because like God shook up Cornelius and he shook up Peter. God could shake up you. And God will do whatever he needs to do in our life to get us ready to obey him and step out into a world that he loves. The great news. God loves you. Christ has already died for you. Christ is risen from the dead. You could trust him today and have a relationship with God that will change you from the inside out, your destiny forever, and make you a peacemaker in a world desperately divided. Let's pray. Uh, Father, only you can do the supernatural. Uh, we can study, we can look for opportunity, we can plan, but only you create divine appointments. Lord God, I pray that you will. Uh, for this church, for the churches in our region, across Minnesota, across the Northland, around the world, Lord God, we pray for divine appointments. But Lord, before they come, may we be ready. May we see in people what you see. May you change our vision, change our mind, change our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.